Praise the Lord, Heritage Fellowship, family, and friends. And thank you for joining us in virtual worship. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Dear, awesome, wonderful, merciful God, we ask that you come and join us exactly where we are, Lord. Lord, we ask that you come and sit next to us, God, that you may hear the petitions of our hearts. Lord, that you may hear all of the prayers that we cannot utter, all of the aches and concerns, Lord, that we have no words to express. We know that you know exactly what we stand in need of, God, and we entrust all of our cares to you. We ask that you would touch every family, God. We ask that you would bless every household, every city. God, bless this country. As we prepare to march to the polls, we know that you'll be right beside us. And we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. My sisters and brothers, the air feels a little tense. As we prepare for the upcoming election, it feels a bit like going into battle. We know there is so much at stake, but I want you to know that we are prepared for this, people of God. Ephesians 6 reminds us to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. It goes on to say, wrap your waist with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness and put on shoes of peace, but above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 18 goes on to tell us to stay woke. It reminds us to be watchful to this end with all perseverance. Perseverance means don't give up now. Our ancestors had to march, fight, battle, claw their way to the poles so that we could walk upright, heads held high. They did their part and we must persevere. We know that voter suppression is real and intimidation tactics will be on full display. But perseverance means don't lose faith now. Perseverance means that no matter what the news says, no matter what opposition comes our way, we will trust that when we do our part, Almighty God will handle the rest. May today's message encourage you to persevere in the days ahead. Amen. Let's stay connected. Each week during our virtual worship experience, you can interact with us at 7.45 a.m. on YouTube live chat and at 10.45 a.m. during the Facebook watch party. Also, visit our website, heritagereston.org, for previous messages and other important announcements. This Sunday morning, we come to you. Uh, hope that we could have gotten this in October as we celebrated or observed breast cancer awareness but certainly did not want to forego this opportunity to share with each of you the importance of being tested, the importance of mammograms. Each one of us knows some woman, some auntie, some grandmother, some wife, some sister friend, yea, maybe even a brother that has wrestled with this illness. According to the statistics from the American Cancer Society, 13% of all women at some point in their life will contract breast cancer. That's roughly one out of eight. And so we take seriously uh, what it means for us to be tested, what it means for us to be informed. And we pray on this Sunday morning uh, that you will remember that your bodies are the temple. Your bodies are the temple in which Christ lives within and that Christ requires or he expects of us that we will do what's necessary to get the exams, to uh, get whatever is needed, the treatments, such that we can preserve the very gift that God has given. On this Sunday morning, I'm grateful uh, to bring a special greeting to this congregation, to this church family, from one who is so loved by many, loved uh, and is dear within our very heart. We haven't seen much of her because of the pandemic, but in this season of pandemic, she has been battling 
her own journey. And I'm glad to know that she's got a family and a church family that continues to hold her in the faith. This morning, I ask that you would help me welcome Sister Laverne Hemingway. We love the Hemingway family, and on this Sunday morning, there's a special word that she wants to share with each of us to help us know the importance of being tested, the importance of treatment, the importance of a family of faith that can walk beside you in this journey. So on behalf of all of those families who are touched by breast cancer, our friends, our family, we continue to lift you in the light of God's love, knowing that he is the Lord thy God that healeth thee. There's nothing too hard for our great physician. And so this Sunday morning, won't you in this moment receive the word from our sister. Well, Heritage, I'm truly humbled and grateful and thankful for my Heritage family. I miss y'all greatly. I just thank God for this opportunity to be a witness and testify, serve, and just know that God truly loves us. He's real. I just thank him for getting me on this journey and strengthening me and getting me through these treatments and truly talking and walking with me. I'm so grateful for the Heritage family and thank you to um, Reverend Sullivan and First Lady Sullivan Southern Five and just checking on us and praying for us. Thank you for the deacons. Thank you for all the ministries, Stephen Ministries, and thank you, God, for just blessing me with great family, church family, and um, friends. I'm just so grateful and thankful and humble and know that God truly wants us to repent and stay focused and seek Him in the kingdom first. And um, just know that Jeremiah 29 11, which is my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures, is that God knows plans that's going to prosper us, not to harm us, but give us the future and hope. Continue to keep praying and keep believing and know that God is awesome. And I'm just so grateful for him and thank him. Thank you again for all the ministry and the love and the cards and the texts and the prayers and um, just truly just being there for us. We're grateful and thankful. Thank you. We miss y'all. My love of the ways. God bless. I hope this Sunday morning you are excited. We are almost at the finish line for the last month. We have been blending our faith and our civics to understand what God calls us to do as Christians within the context of society. Over these last few weeks, as we have examined the scripture and understanding our responsibility to get out and vote, we have been so blessed and privileged to have words of support, words of appeal come from brothers and sisters uh, that are regarded and respected in our community and in our commonwealth. On this past week, we were so blessed to hear from Senator Tim Kaine as he gave us a push to get out the vote. This Sunday morning, there are two special guests, a brother beloved and a sister just the same, who I am excited to introduce to this congregation that they may encourage all of us to exercise, to not stop now, but to get out and take care of business by the exercising of voting. This Sunday morning, help me welcome my brother beloved, Luke Torian, representing the 52nd District of the Virginia House of Delegates. This Sunday morning, not only do we have greetings brought forth by Delegate Torian, we also have words of greeting uh, offered by a sister of mine, none other than the Honorable Rosalind McAllister Brock. Chairman Brock represents, she is the Chair Emeritus to the NAACP Board of Directors. So I pray even now for those that have not taken care of your responsibility, please heed this call. Hello members of Heritage Dulcet Church. I'm Delegate Luke Torian. I just want to take a moment to encourage each of you to exercise your right to vote on November 3rd. This is the very important election for us, and let us do what we can to ensure that we allow our voices to be heard. Please vote on November 3rd. If you have not already voted, please go and vote on November 3rd. Thank you. Greetings, Heritage Fellowship family and friends. I'm Reverend Dr. Rosalind Brock, Chairman Emeritus of the NAACP. Election day is just a few days away and we are facing the most crucial election of our lifetime. And if we've learned nothing else, we know this, elections have consequences. 
I trust each of you will do all you can to ensure every registered voter has the opportunity to cast a vote on November the 3rd. In the words of the late Congressman John Lewis, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it's not guaranteed. You can lose it. I encourage everyone to explore your voting options today and prepare a voting plan. Decide if you'll be voting early, submitting an absentee ballot, or voting on election day. Remember to research the location of your polling place. Get plenty of rest the night before, wear your mask, and be prepared to stay in the line as long as it takes. As a community, we have immense power when we work together for positive change. The power of our vote can drive out the darkness and the chaos out of Washington and in our country. Your active voter mobilization and participation at the polls can impact the outcome of the election. Let's stand united together for justice, peace, and love. I still believe that courage must not skip this generation. Grace, peace, and power. Heritage, it is time to bless the Lord with our tithes and offerings. We are all aware of the economic strain being felt across the world, and we pray diligently for the families negatively impacted. But thanks be to God, many of us have been blessed to retain our jobs, even see promotion and increase in this time. Luke 12, 48 declares that for everyone to whom much is given, much from them will be required. In these unprecedented times, we pray that you will search your hearts and give as the Spirit leads. There are multiple ways to give. On our homepage, click Give in the upper right-hand corner and use the Secure Give app. Or text to give by sending Love Lifts and your dollar amount to 703-337-3347. You may also give through automated banking and by mailing your check to the church. We thank you in advance for your gifts of love. Now, let's worship with the praise team and make a joyful noise unto the Lord.
shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall. We shall come someday. Yes. Good Sunday morning. The Word of God says in Jeremiah 33 and 3, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. This Sunday morning, we reach out to a God that's reaching out to us to hear what thus says the Lord for the words that we need to hear spoken over our lives. I greet you in the strong name of Jesus this Sunday morning and ask that you join me in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you, God, that you still desire to speak to us. That, Lord, what you ask of us is that we call upon your name and that at the moment that we call upon you, God, that you'll show up and you will answer. This Sunday morning, God, there's a brother, there's a sister calling on your name that needs to hear a word from you needs to get some directions, needs a fresh download that can only come from heaven. So God, won't you speak in this space? Won't you speak through this message? Won't you, oh God, move, oh God, through every barrier and obstacle that separates us, that we might hear a word from you this Sunday morning. Lord, we don't just wanna be hearers of the word, make us doers of your word. And so God, we enter into worship this Sunday morning with great expectancy of a God who has never failed us. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us in this place of worship. We ask God that everything that you have established might indeed come to pass. It's in Jesus' name that we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Christ's holy name, let those that love the Lord say amen. Amen. This Sunday morning, as we enter into that final installment of Faith and Civics, I invite your attention to get out your Bible, pull up your app, and join me in a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You'll find these words. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. I feel like pushing into 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This Sunday morning, I want to preach from the topic be the light. On the eve of this historic election, let me be transparent and admit this Sunday morning like never before, God in this series of faith and civics has had to lead me by the hand. Allow me to take the Reverend Doctor off and just be your pastor and let you know, when we started out four weeks ago, little did I know how the Lord planned to navigate us sermonically but I know now without a shadow of a doubt, the Lord has led me to say the things I've said. In the last seven months, we have been in constant communication on endless Zoom calls, bombarded by events in our nation that have intensified by the minute to bring us to a new level where each of us are searching and trying to wrap our minds around the times in which we live. And I hope you can appreciate 
that I've laid on you what the Lord has laid on me to invite you to hear his voice in response to the questions we don't often seem to ask aloud. Am I my brother's keeper? Wrestling to find out as Christians what in fact does the Lord require? The answer is simple this Sunday morning, that we be both salt and the light. That in this time, in the midst of so much unrest, if you let me hold up the mirror, something seems wrong. When the only time we seem to show concern, the only time we amplify our voice is in response to another atrocity, another hashtag, another example that reminds us that we as a people are living in peril. Connie, the constant question on every committed Christian's mind ought to be, Lord, what's my greater purpose? Hear me. We don't need another headline. CNN doesn't have to send us the latest top story alert in order to know that there's a contrast within our context between the world that we live in and the transformative impact of our Christian voice. Something is wrong when the power of preaching rings loudest in the eve of an election, in the wake of unjust violence, because we have accepted a position on the sidelines where we are just churching rather than setting the standard by sharing God's love. Ah, beloved, there's something amiss when our prayers primarily address our own individual needs and seldom ask God the question, what in this world are you calling me to do. It was that great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, stuck between slavery and freedom, who said, I prayed for freedom for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. That at some point, beloved, faith has to move you from your knees to your legs to figure out what God would have us to do. I've said it almost weekly. Faith is more than a Sunday morning journey more than the church where my name appears on the roll. Faith is the conviction God invites us to live into as we press our way into God's power. Per permit me to say it, faith in action activates the shift from what I've read about God to how I serve God because I know God. James chapter 2 says it like this, Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Because the true application of our faith always leads God to guide us to perform greater works. Faith in civics is more than pastor's politics, more than just sideline commentary on the condition of our world. Faith in civics is a conscience check for every Christian that challenges us in the face of what feels like an impenetrable barrier how has God called us to be the church? Maybe this Sunday morning, you're worshiping, unsure about what Tuesday will bring. Or perhaps you're dialed in and feel good because you've posted on social media images of you in your nail, you having stood on long lines to fill out the ballot and get your sticker, proclaiming to the world, you've done your part, you've exercised your right to vote. Side note, there's no shade in that, no judgment. I did that too. But maybe this Sunday morning you're watching on the eve of this election, prepping for the watch party, or still unsure about Tuesday and just what you're called to do. And the good news, beloved, is God says, I'm not finished regardless of the outcome of this election. I still have an assignment for you to show up as the light. I'm not minimizing the election. Lord knows this is one of the most serious ones of our life, but God says to you and to me that what I'm calling you to live into is a place and in a space where you are identified as the light. That if we consistently showed up as Christians in the light, then we still wouldn't have people in our world living on lockdown in unliberated places. If we consistently showed up as the light, as committed Christians, God could deliver us as the change agents for a debased and deteriorating culture. If Christ could count on us to be his light, there would not be disparities in our health care, education, or even our employment, because God could count on us to stand in the gap. Why? 
because we are the light. Better still, we're manifestations of the light, that the blessings that God sends in our lives might flow into the lives of others. If you're with me this, this Sunday morning, there's a word found in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, a word Jesus delivers to his disciples. He simply declares, you are the light. Pause. We don't have to look much further. Jesus looks at them without much explanation and says, you are the light. Deacon Cole, can you imagine this Jesus, fully God and fully man, this Jesus, the second in the triune nature of the Godhead, Jesus, the miracle worker from Nazareth, the one who performed miracle signs and wonders, looks at the disciples and declares, in you I see the light. If I'm honest this morning, that may just be the challenge that keeps us from doing the things God has called us to do. Because when we look at ourselves, we don't see ourselves in the light that God sees when he looks at us. Though the text doesn't give us the dialogue, I imagine what made this ministry on the mountain difficult is that Jesus sees the disciples in a way that they cannot see themselves. They come up on this mountain as Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the tax collector, James, Thaddeus, Simon and Judas. But when Jesus sees them, he collectively says, you are the light. Melvin, this must have been strange to them to realize that in the presence of God, Christ was actively transforming their identity such that he no longer saw them as they were. He saw them as he intended them to be, and he calls them the light. Somebody get this. This mountaintop experience wasn't about what they were qualified to do, but what Christ qualified them to be because he was sending them as the light. Understand implicitly this calling from Christ to be the light was his purpose to deploy them into the presence of places that were absent of the light. Why? So that God's greater glory could be revealed. Hold on to this. When Jesus commissions these disciples to be the light, he's sending them to live amongst a people lost in darkness. He's sending them to folk who can't find their way. He, he's sending them to people who've been knocked down and counted out. He's sending them to some people who need to know, like you and me, that the Savior lives. Jesus says, it's not about where I'm sending you, but what I expect from you, that you don't just occupy space and never make a difference, but that you transform every place until the world knows that I'm the source of your light. You understand the context of the disciples. You understand how the Lord can send them to the sick and possessed. You understand how they can follow Christ, the enemy of the state, and stay focused on ministry even though they've got to endure a Roman regime. That if you understand Christ and his light, you understand how Jesus couldn't sit by and watch the multitude stay hungry, how he fed the multitude, the 5,000, with a few loaves of, of fish and bread because God always shows up in the midst of lack, in the midst of devastation, in the midst of darkness to demonstrate that he's well able to be our light. The question really isn't of Jesus, but how will the disciples live on the other side of this mountain? Can I pull up a little closer? How will we live on the other side of this election? Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it like this, the church is the church, not when it exists for self, but when it exists for others. Jesus tells his disciples, you got to leave this mountain as the light. What a terrifying thought. What a move from fan to follower, because in the transition, it asks the question of the disciples and of each of us, what are we called to as the chosen by God? What is your work when you wake up Wednesday morning? What's the intensity of your Christian faith? Does it shine a light only in light that is around you? Or does it courageously shine as the light in the midst of darkness? Same God who spoke 
into the expanse of darkness is the same God that says to these disciples, you are the light. It's interesting to me how the creator can see beyond the oblique obscurity of what is absent and still sees the possibility of the power of light. Now, I don't know what excites you this morning, but it excites me to know that God can still look at something dismal, dark, and dreary and see something greater uh, and change our circumstance until it shines forth as his light. From the beginning of creation until the end of eternity, God has specialized in seeing something beyond darkness, beloved. When Jesus huddled with the disciples, they're prepared to be affected in the darkness because They're connected to the light. That means they can't hide in a dim identity. They can't act like they haven't been called. They've got to shine boldly and unapologetically because that's, after all, what light is designed to do. Now, I would that you would allow me to pick up right next to you this Sunday morning because God has called us to be his light. God expects something from this experience that will help others to see. God says there are too many lost in darkness. I need you to serve me by being a point that shines a radiant light into their lives. The amazing quality of God's light is you cannot be filled with God's light and not reflect his light. Jesus says, be the light. Let me see if I can bring this home, come at this differently this Sunday morning. If you could see the back end of this production, you'd see there's a film crew whose primary job is to focus on the light. They wouldn't want me to tell it, but every week while you're in the word with me, there's a crew that captures every detail to make sure that you can connect and see because we've been filming with the right light. Every week, Kathy Monroe and Minister V spend the most amount of time on one element alone, making sure that the light is right. They check for the shadows, check the appearance of images. They critically examine every element to make sure there's no distraction to take your attention off of the message. Each week, there are three primary areas they pay attention to that make a difference in what you see. Can I, can I give them to you real quickly? Intensity, direction, and quality of light. I hope they don't mind me uh, giving it to you this morning uh, that they critically measure the intensity, the direction, and the overall quality of the light. Intensity, how bright is the light source burning? Direction, where is the light source and what does it show us? Quality, what is the overall effect? Each week they study three areas to examine the light, the intensity, the direction, the quality of its overall effect. And I wonder what Jesus really meant when he told his disciples that they were the light. Was it more than just the contrast between them and the world that he was sending them in? Maybe it had to deal with a greater scrutiny, allow them and the world to see that God calls us differently when he calls us to be the light. This Sunday morning, maybe the Lord is looking to see the intensity of how well we burn the light. Maybe he's looking to see what direction is the source of our light. Maybe, beloved, he wants us to to stand and to observe what is the quality. Is it a harsh or is it a warm light? We are the images and the representation that are warmed by God's love. And faith in civics Ask the question, how can I better serve God as his light? If in this time of darkness, believers would put aside politics and live as the light, we would discover that light disperses the presence of darkness because that's what happens when God is present in your living. We can live through a pandemic. We can live through economic uncertainty. We can live through political unrest. We can live through the throes of tweets and messages that don't make us better when we show and diffuse the darkness because we show up as God's light. Question this Sunday morning, 
or rather the statement plainly put about faith and civics. It's about how we show up in the lives of others, in the lives of community, and demonstrate with clarity that we are connected to the light. That's why Jesus not only calls them the light, but he lets them know, lest they get it twisted, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give God the glory. Catch that, that they may see your good works, but recognize that the glory belongs to God. If all people can see from our works is our name, then we've pilfered and plagiarized the glory that belongs to God. We can't save in our name. We can't heal in our name. We can't change society in our name. But when we do it connected to God, he's well able to transform us and the world into the light. So what holds us back uh, from doing what God has called us to do? What holds us back? to living into the fullness of who God has called us to be. Beloved, you got to understand the true power that God has given us. And that is for us to stand up in the presence of darkness, cast it out and transform the world so that they can see God. Dr. Bernard Richardson, the Dean of the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel at Howard University, closes every sermon by saying this, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness, put your hand into the hand of God that shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. Christ is calling each of us this Sunday morning to live into our Christian faith through our civics by putting our hand in God's hand as he carries us through the darkness into his blessed light. Sunday morning, as we close this series on faith and civics, God asks the question, do you know what it truly means to reflect the light, the light in your living? the light in your loving, the light in your serving, the light in your forgiving. We've spent too long talking about the darkness in our world. What God wants to know this morning is will you be an agent of his light? Let us pray. God, this morning, our desire is that we would walk in the light of your love. This world needs so many things, but what it needs most of all are Christians worth their salt who show up as the light. That's the command and the commission that you gave the disciples. That's the command and the commission, God that you rest on our hearts this morning. It's no surprise to you, God, the condition of our society. But what you ask beyond the knowledge of the condition of our circumstance is what are we willing to be to transform the world in your light. This morning, I pray on behalf of a sister, brother, yea, even myself, God, that you would transform me and make me anew so that others as they experience would know that I'm connected to the source, the only source that can call us out of darkness to live into your marvelous light. Jesus, perhaps this Sunday morning, there's a brother, there's a sister, there's one God that doesn't know you that have been living in a place that seems foggy, in a place that seems Oh God, as they can't see their way forward. Our prayer this morning is that you would shine so brightly, God, in their lives that they would give you whatever it is, oh God, that separates them from you. This is our prayer, prayed in faith, sealed by the blood of Jesus, that God, we're just grateful that you call us to be the light. 
to your name be all glory, honor, and praise. In Christ's name, amen. The Sunday morning, that's the challenge for the church. Challenge of me, challenge for you. God wants to know when I send you back out in the world, when I send you on the other side of this Sunday morning sermon, will you camouflage and blend in to the darkness? Or will you stand up? Will you be a servant? Will you cast forth as the light? This morning, if you're ready to answer God, if you're ready to accept the challenge, I invite you to reach out to us as we want to connect with you. Reach out to us. Love lifts at heritagereston.org. Put in the subject line, I want to be the light. I want to be the light. There's no greater fulfillment that we can have in this life than being the hands, the feet of Christ. Christ extends to you as he extends to me, as he extended to his disciples, the great opportunity to enter the world as his light. This Sunday morning, as we conclude worship, I want to leave you in a different place this Sunday morning with the song that was written and composed to be the light in the midst of a world that was dark. A song that is so familiar to each of us. Lift every voice and sing. This Sunday morning, it's my blessed privilege to share the gift to you that was shared with me in hearing Lift Every Voice and Sing by none other than Howard University's Afro Blue Ensemble. Heritage family and friends, come on, let's welcome them collectively as we center our thoughts on how God still calls us to be the light. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise, high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Oh, 
Beloved, this is the first Sunday of the month, the time when we honor and observe one of the two ordinances of our faith, the first being believer's baptism, this, the Lord's Supper, that we wanted to come to you this morning in the true keeping of how Jesus gathered with his disciples. It was intimate. It was personal. It was in fellowship one with another. And so this morning, wherever you are, whether you're around a table, whether you are in your office, no matter where you are, let's connect together in an intimate way as we remember and observe the Lord's table. Won't you share in the Apostles' Creed with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. For I have received of the Lord what I also handed to unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But, but when, when we, we are, are judged, judged by, by the Lord, Lord we, we are disciplined so that, that we may not be condemned, condemned along with, with the world. world. Let us pray this prayer of blessing together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
this morning as we are prepared to come to the table together. The bread that we break this morning represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, bruised and battered, marred and mangled for you and for me. This cup that we lift represents his blood spilled on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come, beloved, let us eat this bread in remembrance of the Lord's body. Let us lift this cup in celebration that his blood has covered our sins. Amen. 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 Won't you pray with me this morning? Pray with us this morning. Lord, how grateful we are for the reminder that through your broken body, through your shed blood, that those, O oh God, who have confessed you as Lord and Savior are eternally saved. Help us, Lord God, to remember your perfect sacrifice for a sinner like me. Help us, O oh God, that we live this life, that we walk in this newness of life, knowing that by your love, we have been claimed. That's the difference, God, that we pray that you ever keep before us as we strive to be a witness for you in the world. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God, thank for your you, God. free gift of salvation, paid by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To your name be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us and please stay connected. Join us for the Hour of Power on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and daily for morning prayer. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Have a blessed week.